So the History of Earth series is one that I've been doing for technically four years if you include the really awkwardly voiced Hadian video that had like a three year gap before I did the second entry. But a lot more has been added since the second entry when we looked at the Archean, so much so that 2024 is now kicking off with us concluding the series with the final period for Neogene. Okay, so quick disclaimer, I will technically be talking about two periods, as I will be mentioning the Quaternary period, which is our current period now. The only reason is that it has been argued that the Quaternary period should be part of the Neogene rather than following it. Plus, the only notable events within the Quaternary is the Ice Age, which I'll be doing a full video on anyway. Basically, the Quaternary is a separate period, but most of the interest there is anthropological, which, I'll be honest, is not my speciality. The Neogene was first defined in 1853 by Austrian paleontologist Moritz Horns and differentiated from the Quaternary by the ICS in 2009, having lasted from 23.03 million years ago right up until 2.588 million years ago. At this point the continents were almost exactly where they are today and were during the Paleogene. An exception here is that the sea levels fell, causing land connections between Eurasia, Africa and North America. South America had also shifted closer to North America, connecting the two land masses and having profound effects on the life there, which I will get into soon enough. Now many people might look out of their window and notice that the majority isn't like the Caribbean, unfortunately. And this is because the world is still under the cooler, drier climate that is so charismatic of the Cenozoic. The cooling trend that began during the Paleogene approached its peak during the Neogene. Now, as I mentioned in the Paleogene video, when we're talking about the Cenozoic, it's a lot more common to refer to the actual epochs of this period, since it's a lot more recent and we have a much higher resolution. So I'll be doing the same as my Paleogene video and taking us through the individual epochs of the Neogene. And the first of these epochs is the Miocene. Though things were relatively warm at this time, the cooling trend was well underway. With the drying of the climate, we see a reduction of the widespread rainforests and an expansion of the wide open grasslands. Now we'll take a look at how this affected the terrestrial fauna, but first, let's get a little wet. In the oceans, corals were plodding along with the exception of a local decline in Australia, along with families of mollusks, cephalopods and marine arthropods such as crabs. An expansion of algae also helped to support the diversification of many marine groups, like the aforementioned invertebrates, various families of fish, namely the lobe-finned ones including Megapurana, as well as mammals. We see modern otters crop up here, but the main group that came in to make a statement were the cetaceans. Also known as whales, this group is one I've gone into extensive detail here, and they really hit their stride during the Miocene. Around 20 genera of baleen whales alone existed, not to even mention the tooth whales such as the infamous Leviathan. But despite how imposing they appear, they had some serious competition, namely from the sharks. The most famous genus from this time is one belonging to the megatooth sharks known as Otodus. Otodus tubitensis is one species that got pretty big, reaching up to 44 feet long. But the species that is most famous within this genus is one you've likely heard of, Otodus megalodon. And that's all I'm going to say on this guy for now because I actually have a dedicated video on Megalodon coming out in the next week or so. If we move a little more into land, we see that one of the most resilient tetrapods had also diversified, those being crocodilians. They'd spread to most equatorial regions around the globe and we see strange forms such as the filter-fruiting Morosuchus, a clade known as Sebakids, which were doing a cracking impression of the Triassic Rausukians, and giants such as Purosaurus. Again, video will be up soon. We also see a major diversification of pinnipeds, which include all walruses, sea lions and seals. Now when we look at the land during the Miocene, we see a world that's loosely modern. Some hangover groups from the Paleogene still existed, such as the false saber-toothed cats, hyenodonts and the intellodonts, including deodon, which I'll talk more about here. But the characteristic mammalian groups from the Paleogene were pretty much gone by the mid-Miocene. Artiodactyls and perissodactyls were still fairly widespread around the world, along with carnivorous megafauna such as various felids, canids, bears and mustelids, which is a group that includes today's otters, badgers, weezers and wolverines. But it also includes Miocene members such as the relatively massive Icarus and Megalictus. 
Now, another group that we are relatively familiar with, because well, we are one, are apes. During the Miocene, we see a few very important divergences with apes. The first of which is eight to 10 million years ago when we see the last common ancestor between hominins and gorillas, followed by another divergence five million years later between chimpanzees and the genus Homo. The Homo genus is one that has had several species within it over the years, but it is what we more commonly call humans. Now, the only species of humans left alive are us, the Homo sapiens, but this isn't quite where we crop up just yet. Don't worry, I will get there. The world wasn't all familiar though. Groups mostly associated with Africa and Asia could also be found across America and Europe, such as various rhinos, camels, and even giant ground sloths, which were one of the first to migrate from South to North America when islands between the two began to form. Speaking of South America, it's also here that we see the last group of large ground-dwelling predatory dinosaurs. Avian dinosaurs, more commonly known as birds, remain relatively unchanged from the Miocene onwards, with the exception of the forest rackets, colloquially known as terror birds. The terror birds first came about during the early Paleogene and were the dominating predator group of South America, living alongside the South American marsupial relatives, the Sporacidonts, and the aforementioned Sevakids. But an ever so slight change in geography had massive consequences for this group. Sediment built up over time between the islands that separated North and South America, eventually connecting the two landmasses and creating the Isthmus of Panama, which brings us neatly onto the second epoch of the Neogene Pliocene. As the climate continued to cool and the ice sheets grew, the Isthmus of Panama completed its construction and the Great American Interchange began around 2.7 million years ago. This involved groups coming down from North America, such as deer, horses, camels, proboscids, and carnivorans, crossing over with the South American groups, such as the remaining ground sloths, glyptodonts, capybaras, and of course, the terror birds. Now this mix obviously meant that some heads would clash. The groups that came from North to South actually fared much better than those migrating South to North. The diversification of these groups showed that they managed to outcompete the South American groups, whereas those coming up from South America did so poorly that, with terror birds being the most famous example, a lot went extinct. And this is also where we see the disappearance of Arctotheria, or the South American short-faced bear, which I could have sworn one of you might have mentioned is the biggest mammalian terrestrial carnivore. Could have sworn you did, but I could be wrong. But we do see the odd group that managed to soldier on through, such as opossums being descendants from the South American marsupials. It's also around this time that we see a diverse and global distribution of proboscids, with elephants, stegodonts, mastodons, and mammoths living in most continents, thriving despite the drop in temperatures thanks to their endothermy and large size but it was the most influential animal in this planet's history that got its start around this time. 3.4 million years ago, the hominins reared their ugly heads and decided to start experimenting. Not, not with each other, with, with, with tools. It's the Stone Age. Yes, it was at this point that the Stone Age officially began, in which hominins such as Kenyanthropus, Australopithecus, and Homo began using minerals such as obsidian to use as weapons and maybe even for food preparation. Now the Pliocene and in turn the Neogene period came to an end around 2.58 million years ago and the Quaternary period began in which the first of the two epochs is the Pleistocene. The Pleistocene is where we see the most recent glacial period which has given the slightly misleading term the Ice Age. Misleading because it's not the only Ice Age in Earth's history and we're still in it. This is where we see all of the classic Ice Age animals around the globe, including mega beasts such as the larger mammoths, the saber-toothed cats like Smilodon, dire wolves, which apparently are no longer wolves, giant apes like Gigantopithecus, Earth's biggest lizard, the Megalania, and giant birds like the Harst seagull and elephant bird. But I'll be getting into more of that when I do my Ice Age video. These groups ended up facing extinction though, as the climate cooled relentlessly and animals began to migrate towards the warmer equator causing things to get a little cramped and resources to be strained. 
it is here that we see the very first official Homo sapiens cropping up in Africa around 500,000 years ago. With the advent of humans, which quickly began to spread around the world, life began to see major changes as either a direct or indirect result of the arrival of us. Around 12,000 years ago, we then see what is known as the Pleistocene megafaunal extinction. We see the virtual disappearance of pretty much all of the prehistoric animals left that aren't alive today, including the aforementioned short-faced bears, direwolves, mammoths and mastodons, with the Americas being hit especially hard, losing most of their large cats, all rhinos, proboscians, native horses and camelids. In fact, the only continent that we don't really see being affected as much is Africa, which is why all prehistoric countries seem alien to us because they were full of what we associate as African groups. They're not, it's just that Africa is the only continent that kept those groups during this extinction. As to why, well, we're not 100% sure on that one. It's a popular assumption that the arrival of humans was solely to blame, but this might not be the full picture. Sure, humans found extraordinarily, even scarily efficient ways of predating, leading to overactive hunting as it would with any animal. But it's highly unlikely that this would have had even nearly as much of an effect had it not been for the migration of megafauna into areas where they were simply being outcompeted by smaller native species. And as to what had more of an effect over the other, well, who knows. 11,700 years ago, the Holocene Epoch began, which, depending on who you ask, is the current epoch. The reason I say that it's currently being argued is because many think that we should actually consider this a third epoch known as the Anthropocene, having started when human activity first started showing signs of agriculture, given how much it's changed our planet. Now as to whether this should be considered official, in my opinion it should be, but I'll leave that up to you. So that's it. That finally brings us from the formation of our planet all the way through to today, bringing the history of our series to a close. Thank you so much for following me through this series. And if you feel I've glazed over anything too vaguely, don't worry, it's why I take an extra few videos within each period to go into certain aspects in more detail. After which, I'll be taking us through a few new series for this year, which you'll find out about when I catch you 